My name is Pastor Kurt. I'm one of the pastors around here. Welcome to Base. I take out your sermon notes. We are studying the life of David, and we're going to talk this weekend about a really important passage in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel where David deals with anger. How many here have ever been angry? Raise up your hand unless the person that makes you angry is sitting next to you. You know, we get angry so easily. Some of you, you get angry if you get three red stoplights in a row. Come on, where are you? I'm like, God, why are you punishing me three in a row? I got to get to the dentist. You know, and some of you, you get angry because you have a three-year-old in your life that knows how to push your buttons. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? And some of you get angry because your boss calls a three-hour meeting on Friday afternoon, which is from Satan. We all know that. But look what what happened to David here. Look at 1 Samuel 24, verse 2, right at the very top of our chapter, right at the very top of your notes right there. It says, Saul, he's the king of Israel, right? Saul took 3,000 able young men from all over Israel, and he set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He didn't have a problem with traffic lights or three-year-olds or three-hour meetings. He had 3,000 men assigned by the king to hunt him down. What kind of anger produces an army bent on killing one person? You know, researchers have discovered that you and I are wired to get angry. And it's actually a good thing. Deep within our brain architecture, there is a, uh, uh, go to the next slide, my friends. There is a thing called the rage circuit. And what the rage circuit does is it triggers a defense mechanism in you that's designed to keep the people around you safe. A mild-mannered person, a completely shy person, they get this rage circuit triggered in their deep architecture and their whole personality can change. How many have ever seen that before? And they actually can go into major defense mode. It happens when someone threatens your life or your limb or your mate or your family, your social group, that group that you bond with. Or how about when you get a restriction in your freedom of movement, when you're told you can't leave this place or you can't move to that place, you can't live on that street, you can't leave this country, or even this. How many here have that friend that stands too close to them? Do you know what I'm talking about? They just get, and it kind of makes you nervous and angry. That's your rage circuit going, hey, get out of my space, Holmes. That's what's going on. And it's actually a good thing because you're meant to defend these things. What about territory and resources? And here's the last one, social justice. When a wrong has been done, something snaps us. We said that should not be. That's from God. That's good. The problem with anger is not anger itself. The problem with anger is that when we use it not to defend the right stuff, but when we use it to defend our own ego, when that rage circuit is about you. How many here had someone call them and it, and it just got you amped up? You ever have a conflict on the phone? How many have ever gotten off a bad phone? Come on, where are you at? Bad phone call. So I had this kid in my life, and, um, and, it, and it got back to me that he was in an affair with a married woman. He was like 21 years old, graduate student. I called him in my office. I said, but this is sin. I showed him the Bible verses. I was gentle with him, but I was direct and firm. I said, you got to run from this sin. She's married. She has two kids. And her husband was serving our country in the Navy, and he was out at sea. I was like, this is wrong. The next day, that kid's psychologist called me on the phone. The psychologist gets on the phone. And he says, hey, I don't know who you are, but you're giving my client wrong advice. He says, you know, he has a emotional intimacy problem, and this is the first time he's ever reached out in emotional risk to connect with someone. Yeah, who he's connecting with is a mom with two kids. And I, we start having this conflict. Now, I don't like conflict. And I don't like conflict, especially with people that have more degrees than me. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> By the time I got off this phone with this guy, I was all amped up, and just then, so knock at the door. I open the door, it's two Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> Perfect timing. Do you ever notice that? I'm not making fun of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're Jehovah's Witness here. I love you. I'm not making fun of you. I actually like your boldness. But you guys always show up when I'm either in my underwear or just had a fight. I mean, it's not. <laughs> Do you ever notice that? So the one lady is an older lady and a younger lady, right? The one lady looks at me and she says, Do you know that Jehovah has a fig tree just for you for all eternity? I said, 
Forget that fig tree stuff. You want to make Jesus Christ into an angel and still what he is. He's fully God. Colossians 2, 9 says the fullness of the deity dwelled in bodily form. Hebrews 1 says that we are to worship Jesus above all the And she starts backing across the lawn. I'm just <laughs> quoting Bible verses at her. Finally, I said, you're never going to get out of it. I'm going to look at the young man. I said, you can get out of this cult. You got to run. You got to get. And they went, ah, and they ran away from me. Just, <laughs> just ran right down the street and they left. I came back into my office. I'm like, ah. and my associate, this guy named Henry, he goes, he goes, Kurt. I said, what? He goes, I don't think that was very loving. <laughs> I said, no, it wasn't, but it sure felt good. <laughs> Do you know what I was doing? I was doing what a psychologist called transfer. I took all the negative, uh, you know what I was doing? I was bullied, so I bullied. I was bullied, so I bullied. I, I let my rage circuit defend my ego. You see, my friends, each and every one of us is going to get anger, angry, and how you handle that anger is a serious test. Do you know that God took David through the test of David versus Goliath, right? But he only did that once. The next three chapters, chapter 24, 25, and 26, God three different times takes David through the test of anger. Why? It's so fundamental. It's so profound. How you handle anger is going to determine whether your kids are loyal to you. How you handle anger is going to determine whether you have intimacy in your marriage. How you handle anger is going to determine whether or not you can create camaraderie at work and put the right deals together and create the right satisfaction of relationship in life. All of us have anger, and whether you'll use it to defend God or defend yourself is determined by whether or not you learn the lessons of these chapters. What's going on here? We've called this defeating the giant of anger. And we're going to start with Saul because Saul is clearly the most angry person in here. Saul, in fact, is in a spiral of downward descending angry. And this is what happens to both of you. Now, it starts with this. Saul's got jealousy. If you're taking notes, I hope you are right in that first word, jealousy. What is jealousy? Jealousy is when I look at you and I want something you have. What happens here is Saul's the king, he's the anointed one, he's the picked one, but he gets David on his team and he immediately realizes that David's more talented than him. David is a better commander than him, David's got all the songs going about him, and Saul's like, this guy's going to take my job, i got to get rid of him. And that jealousy produces dangerous outbursts. You'll see this often in marriages where there's jealousy. It creates this sort of irrational overreaction. Instead of dialogue, there's these outbursts. In Saul's case, he literally literally throws a javelin at David several times. He's sitting there listening to David play the harp. This is so frustrating for Saul because he's like, he's a better warrior than me. He's more handsome than I am. And he's a better musician than me. I just am so mad at him. He has these outbursts. You know what this is like? This is like serving on the same team with Lincoln, Stink, and Brewster, people. <laughs> like Lincoln's a phenomenal leader and he's an incredible guitar player. And if you stand next to him on stage, it adds 40 pounds to you. It's not <laughs> fair. Someone empathize with poor Pastor Kurt here. <laughs> and so what happens is Saul goes from jealousy to irrational, dangerous outbursts, and it ends up in the worst result at all, which is evil scheming. What is evil scheming? That's where I'm going to manipulate it and make it look like I'm not doing an injustice, but I'm doing the greatest of injustice. What Saul says is we're going to go out and battle against the Philistines. We'll pick a battle we can't win, and we'll put David in the front lines. And the Philistines will kill David, and it'll take care of my problem, and no one will know, which is never what happens. Everyone ends up knowing. What's David's response? I mean, by the way, that's a lot of injustice, right? Here's one of the things that God wants you to hear. No matter what injustice has been done to you, you're probably not as bad off as David was. And yet God still required David to act in a God-honoring way. What's David's response? Look at it. It's right there. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Abdullam. God's response to injustice was to put David in a cave. Doesn't seem right, does it? Why didn't God rush in immediately and conquer Saul and put David in his place? And the answer is really clear. God needed to kill the Saul in David before he put David in Saul's place. You see... God was looking for someone that had the character to handle the authority that he wanted to give him. I know a few things about caves. First of all, they're cold. Second of all, they're hard. Third of all, they're smelly. Why are caves hard, cold, and smelly? Well, sheep in the Near East 
reside in caves. Shepherds take their sheaves and they sheep and they at night to keep them from wolves and thieves, they put them in the caves. We're going to talk about this later in the passage. And sheep have this little thing, the rams have this little thing between their horns that oozes out a little substance that's very sticky, it's very hard to get off of, and they rub it on each one of the ewes that there's their girlfriend said, this, this sheep is mine, and that stink, that stench is impossible to get out. In fact, in a lot of cultures where there's sheep herding, the hotels and the inns that the sheep herders stay in, no one else stays in them. They're, they're separate and just for sheep herders because no one wants to go spend the night in those stinky places. When God puts you in a cave, he's putting you in a cave with hard, cold stink. Why? Because hard, cold stink is a great way to produce a God-honoring king. Here's what I'm saying. Here's the end of the answer to the whole passage at the beginning. Humility transforms anger into courage. God's not against anger. God wants to take your anger, add some humility to it, and make you brave. How does he do that? David goes through three stages. This is nowhere on your notes. You've got to find some white space to write this in. And the three stages is, he's, first he starts out as a shepherd in a field. Then he goes to a fugitive in a cave, and he ends up in a king in a palace. Now, the problem with you and I is we are all designed to want to go straight to the king in the palace stage. We want uh, that house on the hill driving the Seville with a Dom Perignon nicely chilled. I mean, we want to be in charge. Put me at the team lead. I want to be the captain of this team. I want to be the head. I want, if they'd only ask me, man, my boss doesn't know what he's talking about. My parents don't know what they're talking about. I, uh, this government doesn't know what it's talking about. I should be in charge. If I was coaching, man, I could beat Belichick. I mean, we want to be, that was funny. I don't care if you didn't laugh at all. Uh, we want to be the person in charge, and so we want to hurry through these two stages. My friend, what is the hardest season? It's this one. Being the king is harder. Don't rush to being the king. Let me put it this way. How many here have ever been to the principal's office? Raise your hand if you've ever been. As a kid, you went to the principal's office. Okay, who's my people? You guys are with me, right? I used to think as a kid that the worst possible thing would be called to the principal's office. But I discovered that the actual worst possible thing is to not go to the principal's office as a kid, but to go to the principal's office as a parent. Because <laughs> when you have the authority, it's worse. There were so many nights where David in his throne room thought, wish I was back in that cave. Back when Jonathan and I were so close and he was still alive. Back when I had my mighty men. Back when we were conquering the Philistines night after night. Yeah, we were on the run. Yeah, it was hard. But those were the days. And when he was in that cave, you know what he was thinking? Man, I wish I was back in that field. Just me and the sheep and my harp and the scar stars in the night. Listen, man, friend. Listen. Listen. Don't graduate too fast. Yeah, God's gonna, gotta, he's got a place of authority for you at some point. But don't leave these seasons too fast. Let God complete his transformation in you. And then when he gives you the authority, you'll have the convictions and the character to carry it. And then you'll be so significant and so effective in your life. How does David do it? Well, in this chapter, there are three scenes. We've called this idea, oh, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to skip a fill-in. If I skip a fill-in, some of you cannot sleep at night. Let's make sure that we get every fill in here. Here's the key question. What's the way to say all of what I just said in one easy question? It's this. What should you do when someone throws a spear at you? That's what God is trying to teach David here. In life, spears get thrown. Give me an amen if you've ever had a spear thrown at you. How do you respond? Your response, your natural response will almost always invite more spears. So how do you do that? There's three scenes in this. We've called it Lessons from the Cave of Anger. David is angry, but even more angry is Saul. You put those two angers together, and what lessons do you and I need to learn to try to handle that anger so that in this right season, we're all that God wants us to be? Scene one, write it in, is temptation in the cave. Each and every one of us will have that moment where we can actually take that person that hurt us and respond to them. And the question is, are we going to respond by doing something only God should do? Or are we going to respond in a God-honoring, godly, mature way? David almost gives in to the temptation. Here's what's written in chapter 24, 3 and 4. Let's go right verse by verse here and look at this. He says, he came to the sheep pens along the way. That he is Saul here. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Let me explain what's going on here. 
Now, David was a shepherd, right? God will always use your past in your current crisis. David's on the run from Saul. Saul's got 3,000 men. They're chasing him. David is hiding by day and traveling by night. Now, here's the cool thing. Since David was a shepherd, he knew where the best caves were. Why? Because he had used those caves to hide his sheep from wolves and thieves at night. So David knows where all, and I've literally been in some of the caves that they think are in this area. They're very depth, they're very hidden, small entrances, big openings. And what would happen is the shepherd at night, if he couldn't build a, a little keep, like some places where it's flatter, they would build these little keeps, and they would put thorns on top of the stacked rocks, and they would keep the sheep behind that. Have you ever heard that phrase, uh, a hedge of protection? That's what that phrase is talking about. It's, it's not like this green hedge follows you everywhere. It's this thorny sort of uh, a fence that they would build. And if they couldn't build that, they would build a smaller thing that would keep the entrance of the cave hidden. David goes into the cave. They're hiding in there. Saul shows up. Saul has to go to the bathroom, and he separates himself. You ever done this? By the way, you ever done this? You're like, oh, they can still see me. Even further, they can still see me. This is what Saul does. And he goes into the cave. Now, here's the test. This is so important. Listen to this. God is asking David at this point, are you still a shepherd? The shepherd would sleep at the opening of the cave. And the reason the shepherd slept at the opening of the cave was a thief or a wolf would have to climb over the shepherd to get in and steal a sheep. He's asking David this. Are you a shepherd standing guard over your sheep? Or have you become a wolf who's going to steal something that isn't yours? Are you a shepherd protecting these men? Or are you a thief who's going to take the kingship in your time and in your way? That's the test. Are you a shepherd or a wolf? Here's what happens. Back to the passage. If you're still with me, give me an amen. amen. The man said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and he cut off the corner of Saul's robe. So, so the guys look at David and they go, this is it, dude. Go stab him in the back. God's delivered him. He's far from his men. He's half undressed. Go stab him in the back. And people always ask, how could David sneak up and cut part of the cloak without Saul knowing? Well, if you fly fish in the winter, you know what I'm talking about. I fly fish in the winter, and when you fly fish in the winter, what you learn is you got to put on a pair of thermal underwear, and then you put on a pair of wool pants, and then you put on a pair of neoprenes, and then you put on the rain layer. And if you're going to put on four layers and go out into the wilderness, here's the big lesson you have to learn. Go to the bathroom before you get dressed. That's the lesson. And so I get this. What happened is David went in, I mean Saul went in, and he took the cloak off and he put it over here. And he said, I don't know, go to the bathroom on my cloak. And he walked over here. And David's man said, this is it. Go stab him in the back. God wants you to stab him in the back. This is the one exception to the rule. You are on stab him in the back duty right now. Go take that kingship. God's given it to you. You just got to go take it. And David's like, you might be right. And he pulls out his sword. And he's like, I'm going to go stab him in the back. And on his way there, he looks at the cloak, and he looks at the defenseless Saul, and he changes his mind. And instead of approaching Saul, he cuts off the cloak and he leaves. Do you know who you want in your life? Someone who can change their mind when they're wrong. A powerful leadership thing happens here. David doesn't give in to temptation. He understands the difference between giving, being given the role of king and taking the role of king. He understands the difference between his job to represent God and God's job to judge. You see, none of us like judgment. We don't like judgment. Judgment seems mean and nasty until someone hurts us. Then we love judgment. God, why aren't you just a God of love? Why do you have to judge people? God, he hurt me. Judge him. That's where we are. David's right in between those two. He's like, you're the judge, God, and you judge people, and judgment is right. I'm not the judge. I won't take it. You have to give it to me, God. And he changes his mind. Beware the anger of friends, my friend. Sometimes an injustice will be done to us, and your spouse will be more angry about what happened to you than you are. Why? Because she has or he has both the anger of the injustice and the anger of their loyalty and love for you. And so a lot of times really well-meaning people in that moment where you have to show great restraint 
In that moment, your friend, your buddy, your spouse will look at you and say, go get him, stab him in the back. He threw a spear at you and he's got us on the run. He's horrible. He kicked my cousin. Go get him. Oh, that's funny. I don't care if you're not going to laugh. That's funny. I didn't say kick my cousin in the other services. You're special. <laughs> Write this in. We are all tempted to think that, the, that our backstabbing opportunity is the one worthy exception to the no backstabbing rule. Backstabbing doesn't make you a king. You know what it makes you? A backstabber. So no matter what injustice has been done to you, no matter how they hurt you or left you or lied about you, you're stabbing them in the back is you're signing up to the viral influence of revenge. You're signing up to be a backstabber. And what would have happened had David's men seen the king stab Saul in the back? How many more backstabbings would they have said, well, you know, David did it. He would have released backstabbing. Instead, David had this incredible moment where he realized he was wrong. You know, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where your first reaction is totally wrong. Your first reaction, and you've got good logic for your first reaction, but then the Holy Spirit comes in and dismantles your logic. Has that ever happened to you? A few years ago on Easter, we said to the fourth and fifth graders, we said, all right, fourth and fifth graders, if you guys will go hang these little things on doorknobs advertising the Bayside Easter services, Pastor Ray and Pastor Lincoln and Pastor Kurt will have pizza with any kid that hangs over a thousand door hangers. And we thought, I mean, we were just brainstorming one day, and we thought like maybe three kids would do this. That would be great. We'd get pizza three times. That would be awesome. And so we said, look, let's, let's advertise that in the fourth and fifth grade class. Well, Easter got done, and the report came back, and 22 children had actually hanged more than, I mean, our kids went out there. They were like, pizza with Pastor Kurt, it's on. And they just went for it. And so then we were like, well, we got to coordinate the schedule of 22 people and Pastor Ray and Pastor Lincoln and Pastor Kurt. And so all of a sudden, three or four weeks had went by and we really couldn't get the day coordinated. And then this little rumor started getting back to me that while the pastors at Bayside make promises, they don't keep to children. And I'm like, how dare they? We love children around here. And I've done, I've seen a children break away and take them. We're not crying. I'm so busy. <laughs> then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Said, you know, you're there, right? You didn't think this through. You made a promise and it sounded all great, but you didn't really think this through. One day I just said to my admin, I said, give me every single kid's name and every single phone number. And I went home on a Thursday evening and I sat on my bed in my bedroom upstairs. And from my personal fo cell phone, I called 22 kids. I got 22 kids on the phone. And every single kid, I said, when someone makes a promise and they break it, that's a bad thing. When a pastor makes a promise and he breaks it, that's an even worse thing. So I need you to do something for me. Would you please forgive me, Pastor Kurt? Would you forgive me? And every, all 22 kids said, oh, Pastor Kurt, don't worry about it. I know you're busy. Not a problem. We love you, man. We love Bayside. We, that's no worries. And I got off the phone after the 22nd one. I said, I did it. And I just trashed my reputation with 22 families and told them all, admitted to all of them that I'm sometimes disorganized and my stock's going to go down and probably going to gain weight. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, was, it was a little different. The next day, my phone starts ringing off the hook. And my email box starts filling up. And it's every single one of those parents going, that was awesome. That was incredible. That's the most spiritual experience my kids ever had. A pastor calling them up, admitting that they're not perfect and they need help and forgiveness. That was, can you do that with my husband? I mean, I was like, maybe. <laughs> and and my, my son, people were so encouraging and edifying. And I look at my admin and I said, let's find something to screw up every week. And then I'll call and apologize. I'll, I'll be in charge of the world pretty soon. It'll be awesome. And the truth of the matter is, when you show restraint and when you show that you don't always get it right and when you stop yourself and to go with the flow of your anger, something powerful happens. In that moment, David's men said, look at him. That's a king. That's a king. He could have stabbed him right in the back and we encouraged him to. That's a king. Sir, do you want your son to be more loyal to you? Show restraint. And use these words. I was wrong. I didn't do that correctly. The second scene is all about that exact ethic in David. It's conviction in the cave. I love this part of this passage because it's so human and so real. It's just not a fable at all. Listen to this. 
It says afterward, after he cut the little corner of the, the robe, he goes back to the guys, and David was conscious stricken. The language is so strong here. For having cut off a corner of his robe, he didn't even do anything wrong, but even the thought of maybe doing it made him so soft heart and so conscious stricken. Now, I want to stop right here, and I want to talk to single people. Do you know who you should marry? People always saying, I'm looking for a guy with broad shoulders and a job or this and that. I'm looking for a gal with this fit and that fit and that thing. You know who you should marry? You should marry someone who's conscious stricken. You should marry someone with the ability to say, I almost got that wrong. You should marry someone who shows that they have a conscience and they have the convictions to modify their own conscience. You can't be conscious stricken without convictions. And your convictions do not matter. They're just theory till they're tested in a cave. And when your convictions change your conscience, you're displaying one of the healthiest psychological attributes ever. You want a great husband, you want a great father, you want a great wife, you want a great partner in life, marry someone with the humility to follow their conscience when they don't want to. And you'll marry someone that will make you happy. And by this way, the same truth is for who you should be in a business with. And the same truth is for who you should be friends with. Find a person with a conscience that's listening, not closed. And you're going to find someone who's got king potential. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken. Don't you like the Bible? Isn't the Bible good? Look at this. After that words, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of the robe. He said to the man, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. The Lord's anointed. Okay, here's the guy that's tried to kill him. He's calling him his master. And why? Because he has this conviction. This is so important. He's can, he's, his belief is that God chooses kings. He doesn't. He says, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, we have to stop right there. He calls Saul the anointed of the Lord twice, and then later in the passage, he brings it up at least two more times. Who is the anointed of the Lord is a really important theological question. How many here have ever heard that phrase, um, don't touch the Lord's anointed. Have you ever heard that phrase? Religious people use this phrase. I hate that phrase because it's so often misused. Oftentimes it's used in this context. Someone disagrees with a pastor and they say, well, don't touch the Lord's anointed. That, that's, the, that's the theologically stupidest way to interpret that period. First of all, the Lord's anointed means the Lord's choice. That's what that means. The one the Lord picked. By the way, who's the Lord's anointed in a, in a New Testament sense? Everyone, we all are, everyone, my, the, God picked me to be a preacher does not make me better than what God picked you to do. That's why we do growth track. We do this week three that we're doing right now, this discovery. We're all in the theology of the New Testament, a part of the body of Christ. None of us is more honorable than the other. We are all equally honorable. Your job is as important as my job. I am not more picked than you. God chooses all of us. You are chosen. I am chosen. I am not above you as a pastor. In fact, in every sense that Jesus modeled it, I'm below you. I serve you. Someone better give me an amen right now. I'm... I am, 945 is killing you in their amens right now. I just, I'm not keeping score except for I am. But you guys, that, no, okay, I don't think you actually get what I'm trying to say here. That, that, that's what I'm saying. Listen to me. There is a sense of one person being the anointed of the Lord, and it's not a pastor or a board or a church body, ever, or a denomination. In the Old Testament, there was three anointed. The king, the priest, and the prophet. The king, the priest, and the prophet. The prophet was God's messenger. The priest is God, uh, God's people's representative, and the king is uh, the people's protector, okay? The king is the people's protector, the prophet is God's messenger, and the priest is the people's representative. Do you know who is the king and the prophet and the priest in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus. When you say, don't touch the Lord's anointed, do you know what you're really saying? Don't question Jesus' authority. Follow Jesus. Submit to Jesus. The Lord's anointed is Jesus. Not me or you. I mean, we're all picked. We're all anointed in that sense. But you, when you say, don't touch the Lord's anointed, you're saying, I love you and I will follow you. I'll never say no, Lord. I'm going to go after Jesus. Here, David knows that only God makes kings and he'll never be king unless he has that conviction. And that conviction changes his consciousness. What is the lesson that we're to learn here? Now, before I give you this lesson, I want to just admit something. 
This is harder than it looks. Give me an amen. This is harder. In the moment where your crisis anger thing triggers, it's a little bit hard to go, I'm not going to take what's not mine. And that's why we're going to do this seminar on conflict that you lead. So if you're a leader here, if you've volunteered for anything, we're going to go and we're going to look at the book of James. And we're going to absolutely go after this idea of what are the practical steps to mitigating your anger and using humility to create reconciliation. Humility transforms anger into courage. That one, I hope you're already thinking about that one person that makes you angry in your mind. I'm going to teach you on how to do that. And by the way, the truth of the matter is that all three of those seminars are going to be awesome. Ray and Caleb are going to talk about human sexuality, which is going to lead to spiritual warfare, which is what Andrew's talking about. And spiritual warfare and sex always lead to conflict. So that's, I'm sorry, this is funny what I'm saying right now. If you're not getting this... How I'm tying all three together. Okay, let's write the lesson and write this in. A soft conscience is a strong shield. When you're the sort of person who's not led by your emotions but by your conscience and your conscience is alive, it's going to protect you. What would have happened if they had seen David kill Saul. Everyone would have said, David wasn't made king, he took the kingship, and every single relationship in David's life would become suspect. David created loyalty by showing restraint. You want more loyalty in your kids? Show restraint. And by the way, he created confidence by showing restraint. You want your kids to grow up confident? Show restraint. You want them to be loyal to you and confident in you? You want them to be inconfident and unloyal? Then act in anger. And your kids will second guess everything you do, and they'll never trust you. But in that moment where you show restraint, they'll go, that's a king. And he can be confident. And therefore, I can be confident. Okay, let's get practical. You got two minutes to let me be practical, and then we'll finish up. I want to jump and do a gear shift into the New Testament. Because I know this is hard, and I don't want to just open up wounds of, of, you know, where you're angry at people and not give you some practical stuff. Paul, so Paul, in the book of Ephesians, talks about the four principles of anger, and it's super practical. Now, I'm not going to read the passage to you. I've printed it in your notes. You can read it later. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Look at this verse by verse. I want to just pull out really quick the four biblical strategies for handling anger. So the next time you're angry, remember this. Anger in itself is not sin. When you feel frustrated, you're not sinning. But nor is anger an excuse to sin. Just because someone has done injustice to you and treated you poorly and pushed your buttons and done something unfair doesn't give you the right to yell at them, doesn't give you the right to scheme against them, doesn't give you the right to gossip against them. In the emotional intensity of anger, you're not sinning, but don't let your anger, ex I can't help myself. No, that's not true. If anyone was allowed to sin, it would have been David. So much was done so unjust to him, and yet in his anger he did not sin. Second principle is this. Anger is best resolved quickly. Don't let it, the longer you let the anger go, the more complicated it gets. When you feel anger, go after that person and have a God-honoring, humble conversation. Now, here's the thing you've got to understand about this. How many of you have heard that phrase uh, in marriage, don't go, don't go to bed angry, don't go to bed angry? That's a great piece of advice. Most of the time. It's like a principle, right? But understand the principle. So sometimes I'll, couples will come to me and I'm like, what happened? We had this horrible fight. It went to 4 a.m. I said, listen, having a 2 a.m. fight at blood sugar about what to do with your ADHD 11-year-old is not a smart thing. Have a hamburger, take a nap, start fighting again in the morning. I mean, to just be, come on. Are you with me? Be practical on this. You got to get the principle. Number three. You ready for number three? is anger grows back if not thoroughly addressed. It says get rid of all bitterness, anger, malice, and wrath in Ephesians. This is so wise. What we do is we get rid of enough anger to move forward, but not enough to get healed. How many here have ever been sick? You get in bed, and you feel like, I can't afford to be sick. I'm so busy right now. And you rest one day, and you feel a little bit better. So you go back to work. You kill yourself at work, and that makes your cold or flu come back ten times harder, and you're out for another whole week. How many have ever done that? That's the same thing we do with anger. We have a conversation about anger, and we pray about it just enough to feel a little bit better. And we think that we've, we've, we've dealt with it, and we haven't. What happens is we get triggered again, and that anger comes back full force, worse than it was before. Get rid of all. And number four, anger can facilitate forgiveness. You know what anger is? It's an invitation to hate or an invitation to remember that God did not hate you when he had every right to. 
Every time I feel anger, I try to do this. I try to go, God, you could have been angry with me. You could have been frustrated with me. Instead, you sent Jesus. Here's what I'm asking you to do. It's real simple. I'm asking you to forgive. This is all you have to do. Nothing more than this. Forgive as much as you've been forgiven. You just have to look at people and extend the forgiveness that God has already extended to you. This is so different than the way we normally think about it. You should never forgive based on the merits of forgiveness. I will forgive them when they deserve it. If you do that, you're going to be hurling spears and having spears hurled at you your whole life. You've got to say, I forgive based on God's forgiveness, not on their worthiness. And therefore, anger is just a reminder for me. Every time I get frustrated with someone, I remember of how frustrated God could be with me, and yet he wasn't. Anger can be fuel for forgiveness. If you think about it that way. All right, let's move on to number three. Turn to your neighbor and say, praise God, I'm hungry. <laughs> the last one has to do with what God actually does in David's life. How many here have ever had a bully in your life? Raise your hand if you've known or met or seen a bully. If your hand's not up, there's a good chance in middle school you were a bully. So I want to encourage you to pray that through and get some reconciliation. But we all have to deal with bullies, right? It's one of the, it's one of the stages you have to pass in life. And it kind of, by the way, kids, I just have to tell you, bullies exist in adults. Don't they, adults? They don't just go away in school. And I tell you, sometimes the way you deal with a bully, it, it's frustrating because it doesn't happen like on TV or in the movies. In TV, if you confront the bully, they always back down and become cowards, right? Some bullies are not cowards. I learned this. There was this kid in um, our middle school. He was a bully. His name, I'll, I'll call him Craig because that was his name. And, um, <laughs> and I hope you're watching Craig. Um, it's probably in the video cafe. Hi, video cafe. So anyway, the point is, he used to treat this special needs kid in our PE class horribly, and it just drove me nuts. And one day, he threw the ball extra hard at him on purpose, and I just snapped. That rage circuit just snapped in me, and it went right up to him. I thought, this is going to be just like an after-school special. And I was like, and I was like I'm just going to give him the... And I took this wild, awkward swing, and I totally missed him. And he just sat there and went, bam, and hit me in the nose, broke my nose, blood came everyone. The bell rang, and everyone left. They just left me. <laughs> and then the next day, instead of being friends, he was meaner to me. It was so not an after-school special. The lesson was bullies always win. It was horrible. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Even if your bully doesn't reconcile, even if they don't repent, even if they don't change, even if they don't admit they're wrong to you, that's not the point. God wants to transform you. It's what you do, not what they do. And this is what David learns, fill this last scene in. Scene three, it's transformation from the cave. Dave does great in chapter 24. He does even better in chapter 25. And tw by chapter 26, he does this whole trial again, and he's amazing in chapter 26. Grace transforms anger into courage. God wants to transform that anger, that injustice, into metal, into character, into courage in you. Here's what it says in the passage. Then David went out of the cave and he called to Saul, my lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Right in the margin of your notes, I want you to write this word. Would you write the word humble? Just write the word humble there. His first technique was humility. Why be humble with a spear-throwing evil king? Watch this next. When Saul looked at him, David bowed down, prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on the Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I want you to write in your margin. I want you to write this word, honesty. David comes out with humility. And he goes right to honesty. We want to do one or the other. Some of us, we're so used to being a doormat, all we have is humility. That person's not treating me well at work. That person in my family always disregards me. But I'm just going to lay myself at their feet and I'm just going to be the horrible person that they know I am because I know I'm a horrible person too. And some of us, we're all honesty. 
We march into that family reunion. We march into that boardroom. We march into that situation. This is the record of wrong that's been done to me, and I got the emails to prove it. Here's some cloak. Could have killed you. You know the proper psychological way to handle anger? Start with humility. Go to honesty. It's so beautiful, isn't it? Different culture, different continent, generations upon generations ago, still true to this day. You start with humility. Why humility? Because it's your only chance at real reconciliation. He almost wins Saul. Saul, for a moment, and you read the passage further, Saul almost, he almost, he softens his heart. My friend, you have no chance of winning that child back, winning that friend back, or repairing that broken marriage. Either the one you're in or the one you used to be in. Without humility. But you can't stop at humility because the truth is important. Here's how the New Testament says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. He goes with humility, and then he has honesty. Brene Brown, the researcher on vulnerability and shame, says this. Don't shrink down, don't puff up. That's the spot. I want us to reconcile. I haven't done everything right. But I want to tell you, it can't continue the way it was. Could we talk about this? Could we pray? And you know the other thing he does is so brilliant. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. He does it in person. He doesn't send a messenger. He doesn't write an email. Here's about half of us in this room. Here's why, Mom, I'm not coming to Christmas because when I was 13 and sent some seven-page email like that, tell Dad I hate him too. <laughs> you know what the bad news is? Your mom never read that email. She read the far. Your sister didn't read it. Your ex-wife didn't read it. Your friend didn't read it. Your old accountant didn't read it. They read the first three sentences and said, I don't like this person. They deleted it. You can't write a letter. You can't send a text. You can't tell your cousin to go do it for you. You can't tell your brother to go do it for you. You've got to come out of the cave, friend. You've got to come out of the cave. It's not going to go away on its own. And they may not repent. That's okay. Look at the end of the, cha- the verse. Look at this. This is so wise. He says, I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. Here it is. You ready? You ready? May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you, my friend. You don't have to win the argument. You don't have to get the facts straight. They don't have to admit that they were wrong and you were right. Let God win it for you. Come with humility. Come with honesty. And right now, next to the margin, write this word, faith. Say, God, you're my defender. You'll sort it out in the end. I'm given to reconciliation, humility, and truth. I'm not given to winning in an argument. I'm going to show restraint. Write this lesson in. This is so true. Outrage is easy. Reconciliation is difficult. Outrage is so easy, and our world's so addicted to it. Every single tweet and Facebook post, this is what the man didn't do, and here's what I didn't do, and here's your day. You guys vote like this, you can buy a thing. So stinking easy. You're not changing anything by being outraged online. You're just adding to a culture of outrage. Humility that speaks honestly and comes personally, believing that ultimately God will judge. That's difficult. So why do it? Why sit down to coffee with that person you're thinking of right now? Why, listen to me, this is for someone here. You're so mad at them and you know where your anger is transferring? It's not to the Jehovah Witness at your door, it's to your kids. You're transferring that anger to your kids and your coworker and your spouse. I know your dad treated you poorly. Quit treating your husband that way. You got to reconcile. In your anger, don't sin. Come with humility and honor, and what will happen? You see, David never got to live with Saul. Saul never responded correctly. David and Saul didn't have that moment where David came running across the beach at sunset, and Saul's running from the other way, and they just hugged each other as violins swole. They said, I was wrong. No, I was wrong. And they exchanged bracelets. It never happened. <laughs> but check this out. David never got to live with Saul, but he could live with himself. 
You can live with yourself, my friend. If you'll show restraint in your anger and try the hard but worthy work of reconciliation. You know what you get? You get a clean conscience. The next chapter, one of David's wives comes to him and says, listen, I know you're angry, I know you're angry. But someday you'll be on the throne. When you're on the throne, you don't want this on your hands. Have a clean conscience. And you know what you also get? Listen to this. How many here would like to feel the Lord? You'd like to experience God. You'd like him to be near you. You'd like to connect with him and worship like never before. Do you know David wrote some of the greatest worship songs that were ever written in those exact same caves of anger. Deep down in this bitter, stinky, hard, cold place, God came and showed up. You want to feel the Lord in your life? Forgive someone who doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And God will come in and his presence will be real. And you'll worship him with a clean conscience. When you make the effort to be an agent of forgiveness and to turn your anger into the courage of reconciliation, the spirit and presence of God will show up in your life. Amen. And you'll know he loves you, and that'll be enough. You won't need judgment or justice yet. His love will be enough. Would you bow your heads for me? I'm so sorry, friends. I've gone a few minutes over. It's just that I care so deeply about you and your relationships and getting this right. So just give me one minute with no one moving. Can I ask this question? It's a different question than I normally ask, but i got to ask it. Is there someone that you need to stop being angry about? Is there someone you need to work the hard work of reconciliation instead of outrage? If that's you, can I just pray over you real briefly and simply that God would help you not just hear this word but do this word. If that's you and you got someone in your life that you need some prayer for, would you just raise your hand right now? Just put it up high. Keep it up for a second just so God can see that hand. Saying, God, I want a clean conscience. I want to connect with you like never before. I want to come out of the cave in humility and honesty and faith. Lord Jesus, see every single one of these hearts and hands. Father God, help us. This isn't easy. In our anger, don't let us sin, but let us go after this. Let us not let the sun go down before we start to take action on this, to have that meeting, to have that conversation, to get on our knees and pray for the courage to turn our anger into reconciliation. Father God, in the name of Jesus, bring the peace of a clear conscience. We don't want to be a people that ever takes what is not ours. We have faith in you, God. You restore. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone stand.